We stand and live upon land that belongs to 109 living indigenous tribes. We acknowledge that reparations must be made for the lands and the lives that have been stolen. The First Nations people were able to harness this land to feed and house their people for thousands of years before the arrival of those from other parts of the world. We must now learn to care for this land by following the ways of the First Nations people. To start, we must recognize that the land is our living mother. The water is the sibling that gives our land life. The air and sun are our cousins that make it possible for us to breathe and grow the plants that nourish us. We shall cherish and care for this land, this water, this air, and this sunlight the same as we care for the other members of our family so that we may all continue to live. Now we're going to move to Adam Sweeney, who's going to tell us a little bit about the um, AB205 trailer, which is why we're all here tonight. Thank you, Thank you very much, Cherry. Just a couple of things, everybody. So I'm just going to get some slides on the screen for you. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about what is this bill and a couple of things that that I, I think it's important for everyone to have in mind as, as we listen to different perspectives on how this is going to impact our, our state and the, the people within it. Now, to start, like, what are we talking about? What What is this thing? Uh, fixed charge, utility tax, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's a an effort at the California Public Utilities Commission to do a pair of things. Um, one is to add an income-based charge onto our bills that's independent of the amount of electricity as you, that you use in your household and pair with that to lower the per kilowatt hour charges. Uh, so they kind of go hand in hand. The, the total sum of this is, is neutral for our utilities. They, they, don't, they don't make more money or less money on this. It really just changes the almost the shape of, of how we pay our bills. Now, one of the really important things that, that that's that's a, a big deal for doing this in California is that the idea is to make those fixed charges income-based. So if you make very little money, the fixed charge that shows up on your bill would be, would be small. You'd still get the lowered rates, the lowered per kilowatt hour rates, but your fixed charge would be small. Versus if you your household makes a lot of money, that fixed charge could be larger. And of course, this goal, this is moving costs around, right? We're going to move costs from our, our lower income households to our higher income households. It's kind of like how income taxes work. Like people like to call this a utility tax. In that sense, it is kind of like a, a tax in that it's attempting to be progressive. Now, the big questions around this, like how big should those charges be? How much should the fixed charge be that's independent of whether you use zero electricity or, you know, endless electricity, how big should it be uh, you know, at each level? And how should we shape those, the tiers, right? What are the income thresholds to go from one fixed charge to another? How many income thresholds should there be? The law requires three, but we could have more. Just depends what we decide to do. And kind of the flip side of how big should the fixed charges be is how much should we try to lower our per kilowatt hour rates? There are some benefits to having lower rates. There's trade-offs, of course. Um, and so these are the big questions that I, uh, many people are trying to answer. So, right there. All right. So where this really, really originally come from, it came from AB 205, which was a part of the governor's budget trailer climate package last year. Um, there are a whole series of bills that came from the governor's office to push on a bunch of different climate issues. And there was a little change in the utility codes that went along with that. Now you may have heard that this was some sort of big secret conspiracy foisted upon California. It's not really true. This was 
run through the budget process. So there were budget hearings about this. It was discussed. It was on agendas. It was public. It's not as public as a bill that goes through the full legislative process with all the committees and both houses and all of that. But it wasn't really a, a secret either. The reality is this is how a lot of laws get passed in California. It's not everyone's favorite thing that the governor and the leadership of the legislature just kind of negotiate things and push them through with the budget. But it is how a lot of stuff happens. Now, what's in it? As I mentioned, it requires there to be at least three tiers to our fixed charge. There can be more, but at least three. Um, it requires that our lowest income households save money. That's kind of the point. And it also, most people don't know about this, it fixes some, some technical issues around how other utility fees that the legislature was putting onto our bills interact with the CARE and FARA programs. The, the CARE and FARA programs are the programs we have for our lowest income households to give them a discount on their rates. And there were some bad interactions where things were not working the way that the state really wanted them to. And so those were fixed as well. Now, one of, one of the big things big things to know about in our, in our rates and why would we ever move some of our rates into a fixed charge is that a lot of the stuff we pay for in our rates is not electricity. What you see here on, on the graph, the blue at the bottom, that's mostly electricity that we pay for. This graph is the total, all the money that we pay through all of our big IOUs uh, each year. This is a, it comes from a report that the, the, the CPUC sends back to the legislature every year. But you can see the blue part is less than half of all the money that we pay to our utilities. We pay for a lot of other stuff. We pay for the maintenance in, of, our, of all the wires out there. We pay for lots of wildfire stuff with more of it to come. Uh, you can see, see other things on there. And it's, it's really pieces of this not the electricity part that people are arguing about what belongs in a fixed charge. One other thing you might hear is like, well, like we can do this and it doesn't guarantee that things won't change, that the fixed charge won't go up, that the rates won't go up. And that's absolutely true. Like this will be a point in time thing. Our costs are going up. It's already guaranteed. They're gonna go up like another 25% in the next three years. That's gonna drive up either our per kilowatt hour rates or whatever these fixed charges are, but somewhere we're gonna pay the money. And it, it, so there's no, there's no illusions here that this is a one-time thing. And the last thing I should say there is that the growth in our costs, it's not in the electricity, it's in all the other stuff. So those are some facts. Just a few quick issues that I think are really important for everybody to think about as we lesson here. First one, the biggest point of this, as far as I can tell from the state, is to save money for our lowest income households. This really just doesn't get enough airtime, and I don't understand why. It comes right out of the language of the bill, as you can see on your screen. Save money for our lowest income households. Who are they? Mostly, they're our care and fair customers, because those are the programs we have for our lowest income households. And you can see some examples there of what the income thresholds are for, for those programs. Two, who's going to pay more, right? If we're going to save money for our low, come, low income households and the total money that the utilities get isn't going to change, well, somebody's paying more, right? Like that's how it goes. And so, you know, ideally we force this on all of our, our highest income households and that would be great. They can most afford it. What, what do we have to worry about? We have to worry about things like our moderately low-income households, the people who are just above those thresholds. What's it going to do to them? How does this impact households in that range, you know, above, you know, 75 to 100K, for example? One answer to that is like, well, make it more progressive, right? Make it like make kind of a, a curve that starts small and gets bigger as you go up the, the income levels. Can we do that? Maybe. It's a good thing to think about. Um, and another big one is like, what's it going to do to our, our current solar customers? You know, people who don't pay an electric bill today. Think about that one. Another big issue that comes into play here is electrification, right? Our future is electric. We got to make it affordable for people to electrify their homes, their cars. Uh, heat pumps, electric cars, these are a big deal going forward. We're all going to have them. That's how we're going to meet our climate goals. And we need to figure out how to make that affordable for people. 
And obviously, when you use a lot of electricity to power your home and your car, the price of each kilowatt hour of electricity that you buy affects your total cost. As it goes up, you pay more. As it goes down, you pay less. And of course, in this electrified future, we're all going to use more electricity. That's kind of the point of electrifying. We're going to convert things from gas to electric. We're going to use more. Now back to solar, right? Solar is a big deal here. We're climate people. We care about solar. We love rooftop solar. We want more and more rooftop solar. Um, but how does this affect it? Higher per kilowatt rates are actually better for solar owners. They save more for everything they generate on the roof instead of buying it from their utility. Uh, you know, and these fixed charges, they're going to apply not just to new solar customers, but all of us who have solar, and no matter how long we've had it, we're going to start having to pay this fixed charge to cover these grid costs. They're not really electricity costs, but they're grid costs, and we're all going to pay. It's going to kind of change the deal for, for people with, with solar panels. Now, one, one question that I thought was really important in, in this part of the argument was, well, what is the real impact for new solar? Are we going to kill the solar industry? And I couldn't find anybody publishing anything about this. So I went and made my own spreadsheet. I'm an engineer. I went and made a spreadsheet. We tried to figure out how much, what's it really going to do. And you know what? Solar has always been a truly amazingly good investment. And even after NIM3, and even if we lower our per kilowatt hour rates and have six charges, it's still a really amazing investment. That's You can see the numbers there. If you can find an investment that will get you a 10% tax-free return for 20 years, you let me know. <laughs> it's pretty damn good. So last, almost done. Uh, we'd be the first ones doing this sort of income graduated fixed charge thing with multiple levels, but how new is it? Like income-based rates are not new. We've had them for a long time. Uh, fixed charges are not really new. A lot of the smaller utilities in the state already have them, in the, mostly in the $20 to $30 range. Uh, even out there, there are discounts on the fixed charges for low-income customers. That's kind of almost the same thing, right? Uh, what's really new is having more tiers and having the high the high income tiers be larger, getting up in that above $50 a month range. That, that's what's really new here. And so my real point with this slide is I want people to listen today and judge things on what you hear and what the facts are and the trade-offs and the choices we have to make and not be like afraid of change or afraid that like no one's ever done this before. So how could it possibly work? This is California. We lead the way, right? This, so thank you very much. And I will get off of your screen. And let me just hand things over to, is it? It's me for a moment. Ah, and all right. I'm going to be introducing. Excellent. Um, I'm going to be introducing Matthew Friedman from TURN and and Mohit Chabra, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Mohit, um, from National Resources Defense Fund, Defense Council. Take it away, guys. Uh, good evening. I'm Mohit from the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'll present first. Let me uh, share my screen. All right, uh, Cherry, could you say something if you can see my screen? I can see your screen. Okay, thank you. So good evening. I'm gonna start talking a little bit about how rates are designed, the need for this policy update and how different stakeholders will be impacted by it. And then Matt Friedman will talk a little bit about the turn and NRDC proposal. So as Adam pointed out, most utility revenue is decided through specific proceedings at the commission. So these include the general rate case, wildfire proceeding, and so on. Mohit, and what, yeah. Mohit, I'm not sure everybody knows when you talk about a proposal, what the proposal is for and to. Okay. Because we the have proposal is the same as uh, the one Adam explained. It's instituting fixed charges and graduating it by income to ensure that um, there's better incentives for beneficial electrification and to ensure that low-income customers 
in all investor-owned utility territories safe. So um, starting again, a little bit about how rates are set. So most all utility earnings is decided through specific proceedings, like I just explained. And once the commission um, authorizes it, you know, and through these proceedings, utilities propose turn public advocates are the two organizations that scrutinize and challenge them. And the commission decides how much the utilities are allowed to collect. And once this revenue is authorized, the spendings and earnings are locked in. Utilities can't collect more or less money than authorized. So rate design then is really about how this authorized revenue is collected. No more, no less. It's about who pays, how much, when, and why. So the first question is, what should electricity cost and why? And the economic ideal really is to set prices at what it costs to produce and deliver electricity. And we're going to call it the short-run social marginal cost. That's the correct terminology. I'm, I'm going to use the words SRSMC, and that's what it means. To explain a little bit more, this is the cost to generate electricity, um, the cost to transmit it, so all the losses that are incurred and any prices you pay for congestion charges, and the environmental impact. Carbon and pollution are, are the biggest parts of it. And setting rates at this won't collect all the revenue that the utilities authorized. Because authorized revenue also includes a lot of fixed or sunk costs of maintaining the grid, expanding it, wildfire hardening, social policy goals such as low-income programs, and so on. And determining how to collect this remaining revenue really entails judgment, consideration of trade-offs, and some economic analysis as well. And there are many ways to collect these fixed costs. You could do it based on usage, a monthly charge, and each method provides a different incentive, which would lead to a different outcome. So far, we've collected almost all costs of the grid and social policy on the basis of how much we use electricity or volumetric rates. Things were generally working out. So what's the problem? The problem is this, that as the grid has been getting cleaner, the cost to produce and deliver electricity has been declining. So as you get more wind and solar on the grid, electricity costs less to produce, generate, and it doesn't cause as much environmental harm. But rates in California have been rising for many reasons. And this is the difference between the social marginal cost of producing and delivering, delivering electricity and impacts on the environment, which are the blue bars, and the retail rates. And this difference is stark all over, but especially in San Diego. And this is a significant barrier to electrification. This illustrative analysis shows that annual operating costs for um, a typical gas heating furnace versus that of a heat pump on a current electrification rate, a customer sees almost no savings, but it actually if you were to price electricity at the social marginal cost, they would pay that blue bar. So that extra that customers pay, it's, it's over and above what it costs to produce that electricity and the environmental impacts. Now, the question is, is collecting all these fixed costs through rates or through charges based on usage fair? Research shows that after controlling for weather, the number of household members, 20% of, of the consumers in California look a lot like the rest of us. Consumption is normally distributed. Wealthy customers do use slightly more, but it's not in proportion to the increase in how much they earn by far. And using usage or how much uh, to recover all these large fixed costs doesn't lead to fair outcomes. For example, renters, they have a much harder time reducing usage and bills. They can't they don't have the liberty to change the appliances in their homes or add rooftop solar, for example. And equity. So this chart shows uh, red is how income scales relative to the lowest earners. And the green bar at the bottom is electricity expenditure. You see how 
income for the highest earners is 16 to 17 times more than income for the bottom 20%, but they don't pay that much more in annual electricity bill. So collecting all those fixed costs via just usage leads to regressive outcomes. And we see the impact of that. A lot of low-income customers, those that qualify for a care program and those that are just above it, have trouble paying their bills, up to 25% in SoCal Edison, more than 35% in San Diego. Income graduated fixed charges are trying to mitigate these impacts, trying to reduce the cost of consuming electricity and trying to make um, collecting these fixed costs more progressive. However, this doesn't solve the problem of high utility revenue requirement. And that's um, what turn public advocates and the PUC work on They challenge the utilities on that to different cases. So fixed charge would shift some of these fixed or some costs into a monthly charge and proportional to the size of the fixed charge, you get a decrease on your usage rate. And income graduating this makes things more progressive. And we pay for many other public goods in this progressive way, um, schools, roads, and so on. So there are many stakeholders involved and there are financial incentives everywhere. So it's good to be clear as to the financial incentives on major stakeholders. So I'll go through them one by one. Starting with electrification, which is a key tenet of decarbonization. Electrification will be encouraged when rates are lower. This robust re recent research shows that each cent increase in rates corresponds to around a 2% decrease in electric car uptake in California. So keeping that in control is important to make sure customer Californians are encouraged to buy electric cars. There are similar implications for building electrification. And nationally, a 10% increase in electricity prices shows like a reduced prevalence of electric heating, which includes hair pump, heat pumps by 4.2%. So there's clear correlation. When electricity is expensive, people buy less heat pumps and electric cars. A word about rooftop solar and energy efficiency. Customers with rooftop solar and energy efficiency save more when rates are higher. Organizations that sell these products will have an easier time selling them when rates are higher. And lower rates mean lower savings for these customers. So I'm gonna introduce one more concept here. It's called avoided costs. And avoided costs are the costs that a utility can avoid spending if consumption is consistently reduced for a long period of time. And this is what's called the avoided cost calculator or the ACC. And this is the basis for determining the value of energy efficiency, rooftop solar, and other distributed energy resources for all electricity customers. And those are these green bars. They're higher than the short run, social marginal cost of just producing and delivering electricity because you defer some capital expenditure too, but they're still nowhere as high as these red bars. And the delta between the red and the green is the built-in incentive and subsidy in rates for adopting more energy efficiency and whatever rooftop solar you use to defer um, your imports from the grid. So note that these incentives have been going up every year, even though you know, the short-term social marginal costs have been decreasing because we're getting more and more solar on the grid and wind. So that delta between the two has been growing higher every year. Now, all proposals except the utilities reduce these usage rates to around 2020 levels at most which would still be close to the highest in the nation, save Hawaii. So there's still enough built-in subsidy for these. However, as Adam pointed out, not as much subsidy as would be without a fixed charge. Note that most, but not all, non-low-income rooftop solar customers will pay more relative to a no fixed charge future, but their savings will be similar to what it was in 2020. And by savings, I mean the amount they saved relative to if they didn't have rooftop solar in 2020. And low income or care customers that have rooftop solar won't be impacted as much in their bills because they pay no or minimal fixed charges. So the fixed charge won't hit them as much. A quick note on distributed energy resources and the fixed cost of the grid. Specific resources in specific places operated in specific ways can reduce the need of some future investments. 
but the vast majority of these fixed costs are really in extending the grid, wildfire hardening, hardening, and connecting customers and maintaining it. And those generally don't go away. So word on the utilities. Well, if the utilities will still be made whole, they, do, they, they still earn their money and their profits, and their future spending won't change that much, then why do they support the income graduate fixed charge? What's in it for them? So utilities, they generally want to maximize the amount they earn at minimum effort. And part of the commission deciding the revenue requirement is a result of negotiation, legal analysis, and political. And when rates are already high and quickly rising, utilities have less leverage to argue for more capital investments. So they generally don't like anything that raises rates that doesn't earn them the money. So, and a fixed charge means lower rate increases. This model checks out. The utility proposals have the highest fixed charge and the minimal effort for actually implementing these and income graduation, which may backfire if implemented. So on average, high income coastal dwellers will pay more, low income customers will save everywhere and low income customers in inland areas will save the most. Now, recovering fixed costs of the grid really is a question of balancing fairness and many different policy objectives. The question we face today is, do those that consume more electricity really deserve to pay a larger portion of the fixed grid in proportion of how much they consume and why? And when you conduct rate design, you think through these questions, it's hard to give everyone everything. Rates need to balance equity, signals for electrification, and conservation. And clean electricity needs to be much cheaper than fossil alternatives. We understand that sudden change is hard, and many customers would need time and help to transition. These fixed charges will likely be implemented gradually, or at least two steps and four years. Something to remember is that California's biggest climate contribution is policy research and development. Our carbon emissions are really a drop in the global, drop in the global bucket. What we're really doing is showing the way to other states and countries on how to decarbonize efficiently. And we need to do so while protecting affordability and ensuring that the costs and benefits of all these policies that we implement are equitably distributed. If not, we haven't succeeded and our track record hasn't been very good so far on this. Finally, a note on uh, Flagstaff research analysis. This analysis has been presented to show that uh, different impacts would occur. Note that it's pretty obvious that fixed charges will result in more savings for higher energy consumers and Flagstaff research corroborates that, but doesn't tell us much else. And the reason is that it's a what if analysis. It tells us what if a low income customer lived in a small house and consumed less, or what if a high earner lived in a sprawling mansion? But it's not truly representative of all people living in California and their situation. For example, it doesn't look at high income customers who live in apartments in San Francisco and how would their bills change? Thank you, that's it for now. Happy to take your questions later and answer them. Um, thanks, Mohit. Um, I'm going to put my slides up now. My name is Matt Friedman, and I am a staff attorney with the Utility Reform Network. Let me just um, get my slides shared here. Okay. Um, are folks able to see these? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, um, great. So I've got more material than I can certainly do in the time allotted. That's par for the course. And Mohit and I have very different slide styles. As you'll see, I pack a lot of information in and I'll uh, comment on a few things. I'll make the slides available to everybody who participates in this event tonight. So you can take a look at your leisure and feel free to follow up um, as you desire to discuss these issues in more detail. Um, so what is TURN, the Utility Reform Network, for those who don't know us? We've been around for over 50 years. We're an independent nonprofit consumer advocacy organization representing the interests of residential customers of the utilities across the state of California. We work on electricity, telecommunications, and natural gas. And for over 50 years, we've been fighting for lower bills and rates to hold utilities accountable and to protect consumers. So we're actively 
opposing utility proposals to raise rates and to increase their profits in a wide array of proceedings at the Public Utilities Commission. We're also active in the legislature and other forums. Um, and our advocacy includes strong support um, not only for fighting rate increases, but also for aggressive decarbonization and clean energy targets in California. And um, my organization, I personally have had the honor to work serving as a sponsor and lead supporter of many of California's major clean energy legislative initiatives over the last 20 years. Um, so we see, um, we see our mission as not only fighting the utilities with respect to their overspending, um, and to protect low income and moderate income customers, but also to, to really push the needle on transforming the electricity grid, decarbonization, um, and clean energy. So Mohit had talked about um, the difference between um, the processes for allowing utilities to um, set their budgets for how much they get to collect and then how we get to the development of rates. There's really three steps involved. It's important to understand this in this conversation. Uh, the first is revenue requirements. And if you care about rates going up, and if you want to fight utilities for wasting ratepayer money, you should get involved in the PUC proceedings where the revenue requirement is established. This is a general rate case. It's applications to recover wildfire mitigation and liability costs, money where applications to spend money on what's called grid hardening and resiliency, um, money that would be collected to support the ongoing operations of the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. A lot of proceedings that involve generation, um, resource adequacy, resource planning, when utilities propose to build new transmission lines, those go through the PUC um, and public purpose programs. The ability of utilities to earn profits off of these investments is not decided in a revenue requirement case, it's decided in what's called a cost of capital case. That's where we argue about what their profit um, incentives should essentially be on the capital they invest in their system. So if you care about this stuff, I encourage you to join TURN and the small number of parties that are active in opposing utility proposals to increase the amount of money they can collect in rates. So once we get through that process and we finish um, fighting the utilities and the PUC makes a determination about what they're allowed to collect in rates, the next step is revenue allocation where those costs are spread out between different customer classes, residential, small commercial, agricultural, industrial, and so on. Um, and then we get to rate design. And by the time you get to rate design, um, the goal is to solve for collecting a very specific amount of money. So anytime you give one customer a break, um, another customer has to pay more to make up the difference. So it's important to understand that retail rate design itself doesn't have an impact on the amount of money that utilities are allowed to collect or the average rate levels for the individual class. Um, and the rate design choices have no impact on utility profits. So it's just not the same as talking about average rates. Um, so I've talked a little bit about this. This slide here um, talks about the steps to developing retail rates, which we've gone through, um, and basic rate design elements. Right now, um, fixed charges are collected from non-residential customers of all three of the big utilities. Um, and they also pay demand charges, which we have successfully fought against applying to residential customers, where you'd be charged based on your top 15 minutes of demand in a given month. Um, and California utility rates are already differentiated for residential customers on the basis of income. I think Adam mentioned this, if you're a low income customer on the CARE program, you're getting between a 30 and a 35% discount. If you're on the FIRA program, which is a slice of customers that are just above the very low income category, you get an 18% discount. Um, what, so the idea that we differentiate utility rates on the basis of income is not new. What's new is adding a higher income surcharge, which is really part of this conversation. Um, there's also a bunch of rate design principles that are listed here. You might want to take a look. And these are principles that are supposed to guide the development of rates. Um, and they call for rate design essentially to be aligned with cost causation, to promote efficient energy use, to avoid cross subsidies between customers that are not justified by state policy, and to avoid unintended cost shifts. Um, so um, why, why are we here today and how would this conversation be different if it were 10 years ago? Well, TURN has a long history of opposing residential fixed charges. For the last several decades, TURN has been strongly opposed to any fixed charges. And I personally have spent many weeks in PUC hearing rooms, um, cross-examining utility witnesses, drafting briefs, and arguing against the establishment of fixed charges for residential customers. And our primary concerns were adverse effects on energy efficiency and conservation, which were the top energy policies and priority, uh, priority in California for decades, and impacts on lower income customers. 
Um, and NRDC also joined turn in opposing those fixed charges. So why have our views changed? Why are we now advocating for something different? Um, well, it's changed circumstances and a new opportunity provided by, by AB 205. First of all, rates have skyrocketed in the last 10 years. Um, since 2012, Edison's rates 80% higher, PG&E almost double. And if you live in San Diego, I don't need to tell you this, but rates are two, um, basically 2.3 times as high as they were back in 2012. And even when you adjust for inflation, these rates are so much higher, even on an inflation adjusted basis. So um, rates are crazy and current rate levels, even rate levels a few years ago, provide more than adequate incentives for energy efficiency. As mentioned, I think by Mohit, um, various options for um, the fixed charge proposals in the proceeding would return the volumetric rates way back to where they were in 2020 or 21. That's only a couple of years ago. Um, were there strong incentives for energy efficiency in 2020? Of course there were. Um, and is there such thing as too much of an incentive? Um, yeah, given that an increasing portion of utility costs are no longer tied to changes in customer consumption. So if you try to too hard to incentivize reductions in usage, you're overpaying and you're effectively shifting costs to all the remaining customers. Um, and rising rates, raising rates for the purpose of promoting energy efficiency can have severe consequences on customers who just are unable to significantly reduce or modify their usage, especially during hot periods. Um, and so a decade ago, the top priority was energy efficiency and conservation, but today the priorities have changed with electrification becoming a new urgent objective. And electrification is the opposite of energy efficiency in some ways, which is that you're trying to promote more electricity use. And so lowering the usage based rate makes electrification investments pay back more quickly. Um, and electrification with higher rate levels just isn't very economic and it requires more direct subsidies to achieve that result. Um, Finally, a, a greater portion of costs are no longer tied to customer usage compared to where we were 10 years ago. Everybody knows about the wildfires that have occurred and the amount of money that's been spent to both pay victims of those wildfires caused by the utilities and also to spend money on wildfire mitigation strategies and grid hardening. These costs are unrelated to how much an individual customer uses. Um, and so there's a really strong argument for not collecting them in usage-based rates. And then finally, we have a uh, dramatic growth in net metering. And this just means a lot more customers are using a lot less from the system. Um, as of last year, end of last year, net metering participation was about 12.5% of Edison customers, residential 16% PG&E and 23% of San Diego. Um, those numbers are already way out of date. Um, and existing legacy tariffs provide full rate credits for solar power um, consumed behind the meter and slightly reduced credits for solar exports. And so increases in, in participation in these programs just don't have any impact on a variety of fixed costs for operating the grid. The question is who's going to pay them. Um, and the opportunity to differentiate income based fixed charges provided by AB 205 is is a really important step forward to provide bigger bill reductions to low income families. And this is one of our historical objections to fixed charges that we think can be remedied. Um, so what are some of the benefits of uh, income-based fixed charges. Well, um, it can promote equity and it can limit summer bill spikes. We see huge bill spikes with these large usage-based rates in the summer. We get a big heat wave and people get giant bills uh, and it, it creates a massive hardship for customers who literally have to choose between paying their utility bill or paying for other essential items like rent and food. Um, so we're able to, through the income-based fixed charge, both reduce the usage-based rate and provide new low-income bill discounts. Um, it promotes electrification investments. Um, and as we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned before, um, if, we're going to, if we're going to be incentivizing electrification, we need to have our policies aligned. Rate, charging higher and higher usage-based rates for customers who switch to electric building technologies and electric vehicles just means that we end up having to pay more to subsidize those. And those subsidies are often coming from rates, which is then a driver of rates going upward. And if we get more electrification, we get more throughput on the system and more throughput on the system does allow us to reduce rates overall. Um, and then Mohit talked about better aligning usage rates with value. I'm not going to go into that. Um, here's a little uh, graphic to look at what's been happening with rates um, in the last uh, basically 20 years. Um, we've seen for PG&E uh, non-care residential rates up 53% since 2019 alone. That's huge. Care rates during that time, 77%. Um, for SDG&E, we see similar trends 
Um, I'm not going to go into all the data, but you can see it right here. It is really uh, quite astonishing what we've seen. And this is for non-care customers. Here's the, for low-income customers, the chart showing rate increases. Look at the curve in just the last few years, what we've seen in terms of rate increases. And we are expecting to see more rate increases going forward, double digit percentage wise year over year rate increases. That's the reality of our current situation. Um, Mohit showed this slide. I just wanna spend one moment on it. This is arrearage data, customers who are late in paying their bills. And one of the things that it shows is that low income customers are about twice as likely as non-low income customers to be late in paying their bills. This might not be surprising, but it helps to understand why we would be focusing our rate reforms on trying to benefit low income customers, um, in some cases, you know, a quarter, a third or more of whom are having a very hard time paying their existing bills. Um, this is a slide that talks about progressivity of collecting costs via the state income tax versus electricity rates. And basically, if we look at the California income tax system, households paying more than $200,000 a year pay more than 40 times more in state income tax than households earning less than $50,000 a year. We have a very, very progressive state income tax system. Um, electricity rates aren't the same. High income customers are paying about two to three times, and that's due to increased usage. Um, the state income tax code is highly progressive, and we support using state income tax revenues to the maximum extent possible to cover costs that would otherwise be collected in electricity rates. That's the best way forward, and we've argued that in Sacramento before, and we're going to keep arguing it. Um, there was talk about AB 205. Um, I'm not going to go into this because I think Adam started covering it, but happy to go in deeper if people want to discuss it. Most important thing is that the modifications to the care discount calculation, that 30 to 35 percent discount in AB 205, unlock the opportunity to use an income based fixed charge to increase the net discount level beyond 30 to 35 percent. We're hoping to go in the 40 to 50 percent range. Um, so what is a fixed cost? There's a lot of categories here of costs. This is, an, this is uh, from the proceeding at the PUC. These are the categories of costs that we're all being asked to offer our opinions on. Um, people have differences of opinion, but there are a lot of costs in our view that are pretty insensitive or completely insensitive to the amount of customer uh, usage of the system. Um, the parties that are supporting the solar industry's proposal, they argue really that only one of these costs, marginal customer access cost number two on the list, should be included. Um, and that's the cost of literally physically connecting a customer to the grid, the transformer, the, the service drop and the meter that connects the customer. But there are many costs that don't vary with usage. You know, a customer in San Francisco, um, whether their usage increases or decreases, has no effect on wildfire mitigation spending and grid hardening costs by PG&E in a remote area where fire dangers are high. And changes in usage by a higher income customer have no impact on the cost of the care discount provided to low income customers. So um, we're in this proceeding at the PUC. This is a slide that goes through where we're at. There's 79 parties participating in this process. We've had two rounds of testimony, two rounds of comments. We're in the middle of briefing. There are rulings that are coming out. There's a lot of process going on around this um, and opportunities for folks to weigh in. I think what's most notable is that recently the PUC has issued a ruling saying that they're only interested in hearing for now about proposals that differentiate on the basis of existing um, income eligibility programs, meaning no high income tier will be allowed in the first version. I think that's important. So we've been arguing about what is a high income customer and how much should they be charged. That's been kind of backloaded in the proceeding and will be dealt with at a later date. Um, so what are the proposals? This is a long way to get here. Um, this is a summary of the of five of the major proposals that are out there today. Um, and this is the second version. This assumes that there's a high income tier, which I've just told you we're actually going to backload in the proceeding. Um, but the average uh, proposals here, really it's focused on, the media coverage is focused on the utilities, but Turn and NRDC have one, the solar industry has another, the public advocates office, which is the institutional ratepayer advocate at the PUC has another, and then Sierra Club also has a proposal. And you'll see that, um, that you know, all these groups have proposed fixed charges um, and sort of the midpoint has been in like about the 30 to $40 range. The utilities are, are way up there. Um, this is the proposal that we had put forward for our second version. This is a bit of more of a breakdown. Um, and what this shows is that care customers, we would charge $5. Um, and fewer customers five, we would have about a $40 fixed charge for middle income up to 150,000 and then above 150,000 it would be a $60 um, fixed charge and the average across all customers would be in the range of 35 to 30, 
$36. Um, the utilities, by comparison, their top charge, as you probably have heard, for higher income customers, PG&E, $91, Edison, $85, and San Diego, they like to top out high, $128. So we're not supporting those. We think those are excessive. We don't think that they make sense. Um, meanwhile, now we're stuck. Now we're in a process where we're looking at um, the difference here. So this is the first version proposals that we have, um, where the utilities have proposed a $13 fixed charge um, with 10 to $13 or so. Well, it depends on the utility, actually. A lower fixed charge for the lowest income care customers, um, a slightly higher fixed charge for the next level of care customers and then everybody else. We've, we've proposed a $5 fixed charge for care and FERA customers and about a $30 fixed charge for the remainder of residential customers. And this ends up with an average fixed charge across the class of about $23, $23.5. Um, and that's about the charge right now that the Sacramento Municipal Utility District has, which is a publicly owned utility fixed charge for its customers. Um, how does this compare then with what other utilities have done? This is a complicated chart to read. You'll have to look at it at your leisure. Um, but what it basically shows is the blue bars show the raw dollar amount of a fixed charge by existing utilities around the country, a number of them, including Sacramento, and then proposals in this case that Turn and NRDC have made. Um, and it shows that when you look at the raw dollar amount, but then you look at the percentage of total revenues collected in the fixed charge, you get a very different picture. Why? Because um, California utility rates, IOU rates are so high that even a higher fixed charge actually ends up collecting a lower percentage of revenue than some of these other utilities across the country. Um, what about the bill impacts? Um, so for our first version proposal, um, and the first version we've got here means the one that doesn't have a high income surcharge. Um, we're looking at average savings of about eight to 10 bucks a month for care and fear customers. Under our second version, that amount would almost double. Um, for middle income households, our first version would would create average bill impacts of three to seven dollars a month, and the second version would have de minimis or almost no bill impacts um, on the average middle income customer. And then the high income customers would see um, increases. Our first version would show impacts of three to seven dollars a month. Um, the second version average bill increases of about twenty five dollars a month, and that additional money would basically be used to pay for um, lower usage rates, bigger savings for care and fear customers, and to hold middle income households relatively neutral. But what about the electrification impacts of our proposals? Um, well, what we would see here is that care customers um, for our second version, um, so this is the more aggressive version, would say between 40 and $53 a year um, or 63 to $84 a year if they installed heat pumps. Um, at, that's sort of the operational cost savings. And then um, for transportation, um, they could save 168 to $216 a month. And then the other numbers are there too. Um, these are all averages. These are just to give you an indication that customers we expect would see savings from installing electric heat pumps um, and from electric water heating and from transportation electrification under the new rate structure. Um, um, under our first version proposal where we can't go as big, um, these are the savings we'd see on the right here in the green column. This basically shows um, if you have a customer that does electric space heating, water heating, and has an electric vehicle, how much they save um, if they do all of that under the new structure versus under the existing structure. And here they have, um, you know, here are the net savings that customers would see from installing those technologies. Um, People talk Matt, about we should, we should wrap it up, Matt. But. Okay, this is my last slide here. Um, income verification. People talk about who gets who gets to see your income. Our proposal is to have a third party administrator, um, so an independent entity that's not the utilities that would collect income, and that would be only under the second version fixed charge where we would have a high income tier. We're not interested in having utilities look at customers' income, um, and so we think there's a way to do that. Um, so I'm happy to talk more, to answer more questions, and to go into some other dynamics that come up um, when we talk about who uh, gets affected and um, under a fixed charge, not just based on income, but also based on where they live in the state, inland versus coastal. So thank you. Thank you both. We, we really appreciate your time and your information. We're going to move right over to, um, to Ben and Josh from where where are they i don't see them there they are ben can you talk about you sure. where you're from yes uh can everyone see the screen there 
Great. Yeah. So I am Ben Schwartz. I'm the policy manager with the Clean Coalition. Uh, we are a nonprofit focused on accelerating the transition to renewable energy and a modern grid. Uh, and I will let Josh introduce himself uh, when his slides are, uh, when it's his turn, I guess. Um, so I just want to start by saying that, you know, the title here is really reflective of what I'll be talking about. A high fixed charge disproportionately punishes low income households, apartments, duplexes, and small homes. And the focus here is also on conservation and energy efficiency. Uh, the Clean Coalition entered the fray after proposals had been submitted by nine organizations. And we were just shocked by how high these proposals were, how complicated they were. Many parties, five, were proposing four to 10 income brackets with income verification um, and some of the highest fixed charges in the country. And that seemed wrong to us. And so we came in on the other side of things and submitted the lowest fixed charge of any party. Um, and Matt did a good job explaining that they are now proposing tier one and tier two iterations of these fixed charges. And, you know, in our mind, that's adding unnecessary complication. So I will kind of go through that a little bit more. Um, but I just wanted to start by saying that our fixed uh, charge proposal is streamlined and meets the statutory requirements of the law in a simple way to implement, which is pragmatically preempting another attack on local solar and customer choice by the utilities, like the recent decisions on NEM3 and the recent proposed decision on virtual and metering. Okay, let's go to the next slide here. Great. So this is the Clean Coalition's proposal. Um, and the key here is that a low fixed charge like the one we are proposing will have short-term benefits without compromising long-term affordability. General things to note about this proposal, all low-income ratepayers will save money on their bills each month, paying either $0 for care customers or $5 per month for FARA customers. All other Californians will pay a fixed charge of between $12.77 and $18.51, which will at least maintain the amount the utilities are collecting via the existing minimum bill. And what this ensures is that only truly fixed costs are included in a fixed charge, that rates re retain a high price differential between on peak when the grid is stressed and off peak when there is low demand to ensure that unnecessary transmission investments do not raise electricity rates for all ratepayers, whether they are rich or, or anywhere in between. And finally, that transparent investments, incentives rather, for efficiency, conservation, and self-generation are maintained. At stake here is a non-transparent system that blinds customers to smart energy usage and causes them to use electricity when it will result in unnecessary investments in transmission infrastructure and cause massive cost increases to all ratepayers. And specifically what I mean by this is that the state builds out the grid, builds out new transmission based on increasing electrical loads, especially during peak periods when the grid is strained. If there is less grid strength, strain and more local production, there will be less need for transmission and lower rates overall. Okay. So what we must remember is that customer cited renewables, energy efficiency, conservation, and load shaping will be essential tools to save ratepayers money. On the other hand, a high fixed charge will lead to bill increases for some in the short term and for everyone in the long term. A fixed charge is a temporary solution meant to buy down rates and provide low income customers with a financial respite. However, millions of renters, historically disenfranchised groups, and residents located in disadvantaged communities would see bill increases from a high fixed charge. That needs to be clear. These groups will see some, if not significant, bill increases. Josh Playstead from Flagstaff Research will discuss more on this subject based on his analysis. Without addressing these underlying cost drivers like transmission spending, we will see rate increases that continue to outpace inflation, making electricity bills more unaffordable than ever. A fixed charge is an attempt to solve for a symptom rather than addressing the root cause of the problem. 
The bill increases stemming from a fixed charge, and this is important and hasn't been mentioned, will reduce the transparency of rates, minimizing a customer's visibility and agency in reducing their bill. Under a fixed charge scenario, a family that goes on vacation and uses no energy would not be able to avoid the fixed charge. In the long term, high fixed charges distort price signals for energy efficiency and conservation, and that minimizes the rate importance of ratepayers avoiding energy consumption during peak periods. The result would be overinvestment in the transmission system and that leads to hundreds of billions of dollars in increases over the next two decades. Whereas in contrast, a low fixed charge, the rate that retains volumetric price signals will lead to a reduction in transmission spending as ratepayers use energy more intelligently and more efficiently. And that's the key for electrification, not just shifting over energy usage, but also more intelligent and efficient use of energy. And of course, when we're considering a fixed charge, we are not just considering affordability, as has been made perfectly clear. There are a number of issues that are also intersectional, including greenhouse gas reduction, environmental justice, decarbonization, the sustainable growth of local solar, and energy consumption patterns. So as explained, reducing a symptom might improve present conditions, but will likely lead to much more difficulty down the road unless the central issue is dealt with properly. And this slide shows some of the main cost drivers that are leading to increased electricity rates on Californians. I'd like to focus on transmission first. As can be seen in the graph on the bottom right, which shows transmission access charges rates, over the last 11 years, they've more than tripled. And what that means for the actual bills of customers is that the utilities are collecting in 2008, $4.6 billion a year. This past year, it was $21 billion. And that cost is going to increase significantly. Over the next 20 years, it's been predicted that just for the high voltage side of the transmission grid, the state will need an additional $30 billion in costs. And as the Clean Coalition has analyzed, when it actually comes to the life cycle of those costs, including the highest rate of return of any other assets and operations and maintenance, that cost actually ends up being close to 10 times the initial face value capital cost. So that's the main uh, cost driver that needs to be controlled, but we also have wildfire mitigation costs, wildfire victim payout costs, wildfire insurance costs, and undergrounding costs, costs that are from utilities um, improperly or inappropriately doing their jobs over decades that ratepayers are now being forced to shoulder currently. And there are also costs for legacy generation and nuclear decommissioning. Now, the Clean Coalition's streamlined proposal will directly reduce electricity rates for all low-income customers while maintaining pricing transp transparency and leading to optimum market outcomes for all other ratepayers, which very clearly aligns with California's policy objective. Our proposal, as was explained by TURN, only covers the marginal customer costs, which make up the existing minimum bill for NEM customers. That includes basic metering and billing costs. The cost of connecting a new customer to the grid does not change based on location on the distribution grid or the number of customers within a utility service territory. On the other hand, other costs, including transmission, generation, other distribution, and public purpose charge components are time varying and are therefore not included in our proposed fixed charge to ensure that electricity bills remain as transparent and easy to understand for all ratepayers as possible. And of course, foundational to our proposal is the need to ensure that price signals about efficient and affordable consumption of energy remain in place. Existing price signals show the benefit of increasing demand for lower cost electricity during the middle of the day when renewable energy is abundant rather than during the system peak from 4 to 9 p.m. when the grid is stressed and less renewable energy is available. Helping Californians shift their habits to consume energy when the grid is plentiful with renewable energy and is the least congested will help save the ratepayers hundreds of billions of dollars in reduced transmission infrastructure spending 
which is the best way to bring rates down permanently rather than artificially. Uh, this shows the approach the Clean Coalition took, which is that there are fixed costs that are collected under the status quo, and the Clean Coalition's proposal only changed who contributes to those costs, not the total amounts of money that's being collected. And that's the key differentiator from our proposal as compared to other proposals, is that other proposals would significantly increase and lead to potential future increases in the amount of spending that could be collected in a fixed price. Um, and finally, I'd just like to uh, reveal some kind of key takeaways, which is that high fixed charges do not help the proponents uh, that they say they do. And that's because they reduce the transparency of rates, which makes it easier for the utilities to raise rates or request a higher fixed charge in the future. Um, and that's already become very clear from this talk about first iteration of fixed charges versus second. In the Clean Coalition's mind, um, it is not only not necessary to have a second fixed charge, but adds unnecessary complication and leads to a situation where we have the same fight again in the future. And the people who will end up getting hurt by it, as Josh will show, are not necessarily just the wealthy. It will be the middle class. Um, in addition, reallocating costs is not the same as permanently lowering rates by addressing the main cost drivers. Um, in this year alone, we've seen PG&E request a rate increase of 9% and SDG&E a rate increase of 8%. And it's already very clear that PG&E is going to be requesting up to 32% higher rates by 2026. Simply buying back the rate by a few years back to 2020 or 2019 doesn't do anything if we're not changing that. And finally, the best way to increase affordability is by deploying distributed energy resources like local solar and enabling local choice. And I will leave it there and turn it over to Josh. Great, thanks, Ben. I feel a little unarmed here with only three slides uh, compared to everyone else, uh, but Josh placed it here with Flagstaff Research. Uh, I got a call out from NRDC at, at the start. Uh, let's get into what the report in the white paper uh, I drafted shows. So I did a white paper uh, back at the beginning of the summer when these proposals first came out. I think most people were expecting them to fall in the 10 to $20 range. They did not fall in that range. Uh, and a lot of people I worked with asked uh, Flagstaff Research to do an assessment of the various proposals that were out there and they, how they would impact electrification as well as various customer classes to understand these proposals. Uh, my background is in energy analysis and policy and energy performance modeling, uh, 20 years experience. Uh, I've done work for National Renewable Energy Labs, EPRI, and many in the industry, anywhere going from EV charging to heat pump water heaters to heat pump space conditioning, uh, to solar and storage. Uh, so what we did in the white paper, uh, it, it's been submitted, Ben can provide it to, to anybody who wants. Uh, you know, we basically looked at the proposals from the CPUC Public Advocates Office, NRDC Turn, Clean Coalition. We also looked at the original IOU proposals from the three major IOUs, but that proved to be so volatile, they resubmitted. So I'm not showing that here, it, but it was the highest of all four. Um, and what we did was we basically looked at these uh, the impacts of these proposals using uh, U.S. Department of Energy energy modeling. We looked at the three utilities, three climates, Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric were in the coastal climates. PG&E, we used the inland climate of, San, of Sacramento to look at that. And then what we did was we basically loaded up those energy usages under the current existing tariffs as well as the proposed tariffs. Uh, and we looked at three tariff structures, the flat tariffs, the time of use tariff and the electrification tariff, because those were all in the existing rate base and all in the proposals. So for example, in PG&E, that would be the E1, ETOUC, and E-Electric. Uh, and then we looked at two uh, household incomes. We did break out care customers, but then we looked at non-care in terms of California median income, at $84,000 of household income, and then a, a typical $150,000 household income. And one of the things I just would say, most some people say 150,000 is a high income level. I just remind people that's two teachers or a teacher and an AC transit driver living in the same household. You know, that, I wouldn't exactly call that high income. That's higher income, but still pretty typical of a California household. 
Uh, and then what we did was we looked at their current annual bills for electricity and what the proposed bill impact would be under these different proposals in these climates under each tariff. Um, and one of the major things that was not widely understood when we saw when we got into this analysis was most people were presenting the bill impact for the average customer. What I mean, the average customer, I mean the typical annual usage in California is about 6,000 kilowatt hours a year. That would be representative of a, of a 2,500 square foot home built in 2016 to our, our Title 24 standards. But as you can see in, in the lower left there, yes, 60% of California households are right around plus or minus 10% of that annual usage. But we have 20% of the households you'll see that are lower usage. Those tend to be, as Ben would say, the apartments, the condos, the small town homes that will use less than half of that typical average usage in California. And then over on the right side, you'll see, we all know people who live in 4,000 square foot houses or have swimming pools or hot tubs in the back that will use 12,000 plus kilowatt hours a year. That would be like typical bills of $350, $400 a month. Uh, that we'll use twice the average. So when we say here's a typical household, there's no typical household. There's three classes of households, low, medium, and high, and we'll show the impact across all three. So Ben, if you go to the next slide. All right, so this is a, a bubble chart. We seem to have lost the title on the slide, but what this bubble chart shows is the way the California Energy Commission breaks out household energy use, they break it out by multifamily and single family detached. Uh, and they give low, medium, and high in each, uh, each housing style class. The size of each bubble here that you see is based on the, the, um, the percent representation of the rate base. The larger the bubble, the more of the rate base that bubble uh, uh, represents. And what you can see on the low end there, down around 1,500 kilowatt hours a year, that would be the low usage in a multifamily apartment. And if you go over to the right side here, we see your single family high use. Um, that's a single family detached high usage category. And of course there's three multifamily and three single family detached in there. The largest bubble that you see right in there anchored at 5,000 kilowatt hours, this is in pg e service territory, is that sort of 2,500 square foot home, the average usage of single family detached. And if you look across the top row of these, there it says for the NRDC, uh, Cal Advocates and the Clean Coalition, these are for $84,000, which is the medium California income. This is the bill impact across each one of those representative dwellings. And you can see there, if we look at the leftmost, the NRDC term proposals, that 5,000 kilowatt hour per year home, single family detached, is basically no net impact to that home. Everybody's right, no net impact. If you go off to the left, the lowest user, what happens is that the fixed charge outstrips the 20 to 30% uh, decrease in the variable rate, and you can end up uh, up around $300 increase in annual bill impacts for that median uh, income household. And then at the far right, anybody who's using you know more than that 5,000 kilowatt hours a year is of course seeing a variable charge reduction. The variable the reduction in the variable charge more than compensates for the fixed charge, and they can be saving over $1,000 a year. Uh, some of the issues in using a fixed charge implement uh, in just saying, the more you use, the more you save. None of these proposals and none of this rate structure can differentiate between a swimming pool in your backyard and an EV in your driveway. There's no way of knowing what that increased 6,000 kilowatt hours is doing. Is it is a bigger house? Is it a door left open? Uh, or is it a hot tub, a spa, or a swimming pool in the backyard? As you go across, uh, the Cal Advocates uh, has about a $30 uh, a month fixed charge. You can see the slope of that line, it gets a little less. And then one of the lowest cost proposals in here has been mentioned, the Clean Coalition proposal is one of the lowest fixed charges. It gets more and more horizontal, less impact as you go across the usage classes there. If we were to model what our tariffs are today, which zero fixed charge, they all lie on the, on the flat line. There'd be no bill impact for anybody, which is the, the status quo. Um, what happens is you jump down into the $150,000 annual household income is that entire um, slope of the line just shifts up. The, the variable rates do not get any more or less of a discount, but the fixed charge increases, which just means the entire curve shifts up, meaning everybody is seeing slightly less savings as a result of the higher, uh, the higher fixed charge uh, from the higher income. Um, 
And so that's sort of the result. This is it in a nutshell. The white paper shows much more detail than this, uh, but the bubble chart basically low energy users will see higher, anybody below that balance point of about 5,000 kilowatt hours a year will see an increase in bills. People above that 5,000 kilowatt hours a year will see a decrease in bills. Uh, ben, jump to the next slide. All right, and then this last slide yeah, here. You could just go quick on this one. We're running running over time. So. All right, I will make this as quick as it. This is about the electrification. One of the things that's been brought forward is fixed charges by decreasing the variable rates, uh, enable electrification. So what we did was we looked at the gas uh, bills for all these different homes there. If you look at the top, you can see the annual gas charges, depending on low or high efficiency uh, gas appliances. And then below that, you have the electrification use. So if we moved all those gas appliances to electrification and you divide how much they were spending on gas by their increased kilowatt hour of electric, you actually get a break even dollar per kilowatt hour rate that these proposals would need to deliver to break even, not save money for the customer, but to break even in moving from gas to electric. And you can see there for low efficiency gas appliances, it's, it's right around 20 cents a kilowatt hour, 20, 25. But if you're using high efficiency modern gas appliances, it's anywhere from 15 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour. And the issue that we saw was the proposals do not do enough to enable electrification. They cannot achieve, except in one instance, do they meet that break even rate and provide savings. And the last thing I'll say, it's all in the white paper. If we want to enable electrification, Flagstaff Research and myself, incredibly pro-electrification, pro-heat pumps. Uh, the way to do it is to actually not use a fixed charge, but to do a, what we call a highly differentiated TOU. Uh, and I'll just tell you that electrification, heat pump water heaters and heat pump space heating, two thirds of their usage is winter off peak when electricity is the cheapest, the marginal cost of distribution is the cheapest. Heat pump water heaters and heat pump space heating only use 3% of their annual usage in the summer on peak. So if you drop the off peak winter rates towards the avoided cost basis, towards five to 10 cents, which is still above the utilities avoided cost, you can actually meet or break those break even rates without adding a, um, a high fixed charge. All right, that's it. Thanks a lot, you guys. Okay. We're going to move on to Joe Desmond. Joe, why don't you tell us about your organization? Sure. Uh, my organization is the California Efficiency and Demand Management Council. Uh, it's been around for about 14 years, and they focus on, as you would expect, uh, energy efficiency, but also distributed energy resources, um, electrification, uh, trends, uh, I want to say, uh, transportation electrification and demand response uh, a program. So it really encompasses all aspects of that industry in its entirety. And uh, I'm, I'm happy and appreciate the opportunity. What what I'd like to do here is just maybe um, I don't have video to start. So I'm just going to speak to these. Uh... We, we lost your picture, sir. Nope. Sorry. There you How's go. that? Is that still working now? That's better. Yeah, that's uh, great. Right, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, what I wanted to do is just uh, uh, highlight just a couple of things here. Uh, first, I, I really appreciate the comments and the work that has gone into all of this analysis and conversation, uh, in, including the all the uh, preparation, Cherry and Adam, that, that you've done making this uh, making this conversation possible today. Um, what, what I would say is a few things. Um, when I look at this, I, I sometimes like to take a step, step back and highlight some of the challenges that we, we are not opposed to fixed charges uh, in much the same way you've heard a number, um, number of folks here. It's what is the cost of those? How will they be adjusted on an annual basis? I, I mean, it's when we think about this, it's all about how do customers make decisions when whether or not they'll invest in efficiency or electrification uh, decarbonization technologies. And um, the first thing I, I would point out is that the, the assumption that increased fixed charges and reduced volumetric charges are going to lead to electrification among ratepayers hasn't been validated at all. I mean, there is some work we could talk about. Um, I've seen some uh, studies that were done for disadvantaged communities as to how they would uh, look and evaluate these programs. But simply just assuming that it's a reduction in volumetric rate ignores all the other issues that go into decision making among all, all types of uh, customers. And so you have people requirements. Uh, the screening, do they own, do they uh, rent, is it tech savvy, do they have medical needs, you know, do they have preferences on 
technology or, or even manufacturers. And then when you're looking at these projects, you've got to consider a roof condition, the existing HVAC, water heaters, um, panel sizes, Wi-Fi, uh, and then the grid, you know, the line voltage there to the house, the reliability, uh, the harmonics, the interconnection capacity and the delays that there, all of those are just other criteria that impact what, what those gone. So we're not saying that you can't, uh, it's just that there's a lot more that people think about when it comes time to making investments or how they spend their money. Um, the second, uh, second point I would make here is that the uh, forecasted rates uh, present a challenge to electrification and affordability. I, everyone's made this case for bundled residential customers. I'm not, not going to belabor the fact that the rates are outrageous. Uh, they continue to go higher. I don't know if anyone said this, but one of the um, estimates on the transportation electrification of the distribution system yeah, is also expected between 30 and $50 billion. Now, that's on top of all the other things that everybody was saying. Um, we have heard from certain organizations, and nobody here, but that electrification and energy efficiency uh, are competing, uh, and they're not in competition. In fact, the most recent analysis and work and study that's been done was released in, I want to say, uh, June from the Alliance to Save Energy, uh, sorry, American Council for the uh, <clears throat> Energy Efficient Economy. And what they concluded with regard to all, and this is everybody wants to see the decarbonization achieved, was that energy efficiency has a crucial role in decarbonizing the system and paving the way for the high renewable energy future. And that's true uh, even if low levels of building electrification uh, depress future electricity demand. That's <clears throat> energy efficiency provides more value the more quickly electricity generation decarbonizes by offsetting the escalating costs of fossil-based uh, fossil energy and carbon systems, things uh, that were stated before. Under an analysis of five of uh, 20 grids across the country, including these are electrical grids, a massive uh, grids that are there, uh, including uh, California, they found energy efficiency reduces costs that otherwise would be passed on to customers by avoiding energy and generation capacity and transmission costs with estimated savings of between 10 and 19 billion annually per grid region, region by 2050. And I could go on to talk about uh, efficiency and reducing maximal an annual load and energy uh, measures uh, regarding thermal space and the benefits there. I, I could continue, but the point is that energy efficiency by statute is the first thing California is supposed to do that hasn't changed. Um, and at least for the rest of the country, they're still pursuing those same types of uh, requirements and objectives. Other things, um, I, you've heard already emphasis on the average bill impact. It, 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 uh, it, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't really speak to uh, the actual people who will be uh, Im impacted there. Um, the other thing, what I would say is the first phase to the extent that people wanna move is, is do a pilot. Uh, we're, not, we're not saying no. We're saying do a pilot the same way California has always done a pilot. Um, the fact is the proposals that the IOUs have put forth, what they call their future vision, is to get back where they, they were, which is that $138 a month. And you just can't imagine what that means. Um, 15, it's over 15, uh, 1000 yeah, $1,500 a year on fixed charges that are bound to increase every year, irrespective of whether they're energy specific tied, they're still charges you pay, which brings me back to the uh, total bill issue is there is a we we run the risk if we're not smart about making and maximizing efficiency and demand response to minimize these requirements um for an affordability crisis uh where people cannot they cannot withstand these prices um and eventually that that runs the risk of grid defection where people say you know i either i'm going to move or i'm going to start generating my own power we're not there but but clearly that's something to 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 be concerned the last thing um i would add is the well two two things the cost so once we get past this um first version if if they were to go beyond this and right now what is being proposed by 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 folks here is no requirement to go out and verify income data and so the thing i wanted to highlight is there there is a lot of misunderstanding around what it's going to take to actually get this information and then utilize simply saying that the utility doesn't see it is not the same because the laws protect your income uh you don't have to give that it's protected under the 
uh, California Constitution. It's protected in the uh, the U.S. Constitution. It would take a change. It, it'd be. It, I just can't see how that's working. But even if it, it eventually got there, it's going to go through the court system. It's going to take some time. So I just want to be uh, let people know that a couple things. Income, the utility doesn't have income data. Um, they don't have that, and it's not available uh, to, to them or to a third party. Doesn't just get that, especially under California um, uh, a, a privacy laws. You, you just can't have that happen. Secondly, income is often unrelated to wealth. It is unrelated to the cost of service, how much you make, that many residents have multiple people, unrelated people paying taxes. So how are you going to get that information? How are you going to uh, do that? Many residents have people who pay no taxes. We have to recognize that. So how does that impact that group? Does it create another whole section of folks that uh, are not uh, paying their taxes and yet not, not paying the same amount as others? What are you going to do with um, ADUs, uh, uh, dwelling units? You know, how are you going to charge that? Um, and most people, you can just simply, if you put your child on, he has no income. The, the ways to game the system have to be really thought through. Um, and also the issue of housing occupancy. Uh, you've got houses, you know, are not necessarily, the occupancy is not always tied to the, uh, the, the ownership. You have owner occupants, you have renters. You have trusts. I mean, there was one company that I wanted to say, uh, Atherton, who had 80% of their houses in that city were all in a, a separate trust. It, no income that you could try. That's a commercial uh, building. How do, what about the REITs and the investors that are, that are owning these projects um, or Airbnbs? I, I mean, the list goes on, but you get the sense of the challenge of the mechanics of going beyond trying to get this income. Arguably, I would say somebody ought to do an analysis because it would probably be cheaper to simply issue a, a credit to the to the uh, folks that uh, in, in most need, as opposed to all of the uh, implementation and analysis and, and the disruption that that will occur. But fundamentally, it comes down to this. People don't want to share income data with a utility or with a utilities person. The idea that we have seen in some recommendations, and, and again, nobody here, that customers be put on the highest, most expensive default rate, and then only can get off by providing the information you need is not going to be interpreted well, no matter what you think about how clever or how practical that might be as, as getting that information. As I said, the laws protect tax return privacy. Um, it will hit, as you've heard, apartments hard. You know, it's not even clear if we're talking about gross income or net income. I believe it to be gross income um, based on the way the 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 treatment of the, the some of the other of that. And then if it is a tax, that's a whole set of different questions because a PUC doesn't have the authority to actually have the tax. It has to go back to the legislature. So I say all this because we would like to appropriately take the time to better understand what can we do and what are the alternatives? There are other ideas. Last thing I would say is the country, not the country, but the state of California really needs to be thinking about what it has to get done and where the, the, the opportunities are changed. And I would just say there are good examples with uh, Burbank where they have a customer charge and they, they have the service size allocated based on apartments at $1.48 and single family $3 and large single family $8.99 based on the panel amp. Um, and then they have their, their rates. But Fundamentally, California has to come to terms with the revenue requirement that the utilities are having here, and that is they have above average return on equity, they have above average equity capitalization uh, ratios, they have above average executive compensation, they have high stranded costs, I could go down the list. At the end of the day, we can talk about the the um, elements of the bill and, and how it's being less expensive, but you're still paying the total bill, and that total bill absent uh, correcting these systems is going to continue to go up. So I, the importance from our side is energy efficiency and distributed resources, including solar and behind the uh, meter battery are all critical to making sure we don't find ourselves in that, in, in that situation. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks. Thanks for your thoughts and your ideas. Dave, you want to step up? Okie dokes. Can you hear me okay? I can. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Just give me a sec. And thank you. While I'm sharing my screen, thank you for having me here. 
So thanks everyone for being here. Thank you for being here. Okie dokie. Good, you can see it. All right, I want to put a uh, try to put a human face on uh, who's affected by high fixed charges. Um, some things that we probably agree on, just to state them: one, electricity prices are too high. Millions of people are struggling to make ends meet under California's really high cost of living. To address climate change, we're going to need to transition off of fossil fuels. Um, through both big growth and renewable and alternative fuels, and then also electrifying everything. Uh, and that we have to do this really quickly, um, and that it's doable, um, that it's necessary, and also it's really, really hard. Um, let's just level set a few things. Um, first, the national fixed charge average is about $11 a month. So a $30 a month fixed charge, just to use that as an example, would be three times the national average. And for California, which doesn't have much of a fixed charge right now, um, in the IOU territories, that's like going from zero to 100 on a curvy stretch of Highway 101. So I want to level set just where we stand right now in relation to what the rest of the country does. I also just want to address AB 205, which is where is the larger budget trailer bill that the fixed charge provision was inserted into, was introduced and passed in three days. There was no public discussion of the fixed charge provision. And nobody has ever said that it was secret. It was not secret. It was, of course, it was out in the open but it was inserted into a large bill without any discussion. Most people, including most of the legislature that voted on it, was not even aware that that provision was in the trailer bill, which passed in three days. And we know this because many legislators are now saying that it was basically rammed through by the governor's office. Um, some things that we know from the presentations that you've just gotten that I won't repeat. One, a high fixed charge is not going to solve the problem of high electricity prices, which is the root cause of the problem that we all agree we need to solve. What a high fixed charge will do is increase bills on millions of low energy users who do not qualify for CARE or FARA. So let's break that down a little bit and put a human face on it. So who are low energy users who don't qualify for CARE or FARA? This is by no means comprehensive, but this, what I have here, gets you an awful lot of people. Um, so first, they live in an apartment, a condo, or small home. You've heard that. Um, if you're a one to two person household, you'd be making more than the CARE cutoff, which is $39,440 a year. So if you make above that and you're a one to two person household, you're not eligible for CARE. Or for example, a four person household that makes more than the FARA cutoff of $75,000 a year. So if you make a little more than that, you're not eligible for FARA. There are a lot more categories than this, but I'm just giving you this as an example. These are the kinds of people um, who are low energy users who don't qualify for CARE or FARA. So for example, a single parent making $40,000 a year living in an apartment, a family of four making $76,000 a year, $1,000 more than the FARA cutoff living in a condo, a retired couple living off of social security and a tiny little bit of savings in a small house. And then as Josh mentioned, this is also teachers and cops and nurses, uh, AC transit drivers, other what you would call like working class professionals who seem wealthy on paper because maybe they make 150, 160, maybe even 170,000 a year, but in high cost California, they're barely making it. And um, I wanna just make a point that is, the, the, the coalition that we work with on this um, includes a lot of frontline community, um, groups that work in frontline communities. And there is one thing that I hear over and over again that aggravates them to no end, which is when policymakers and people in the elite sphere um, basically equate care and fair customers with low income, as if somehow that's it. As soon as you hit the cutoff, then you're not low income anymore. And as hopefully these these demonstrate these examples demonstrate, it's a completely arbitrary cutoff. It's just the government kind of just sets a number and says this is what makes you eligible and this is what not. But there's a lot of people who are not eligible who are functionally low income. And then so so we should just say this is about moderate income people. This is functionally low income people who are barely making it, as well as what we would call those working class professionals who are hardly wealthy. And that's who we're talking about here. Um, when we talk about people whose bills are going to go up if we do a high utility tax. And so just to be clear, even a $30 a month fixed charge is going to increase these people's electricity bills and millions of more people like it. A high fixed charge is not going to solve the problem of high electricity prices. It really just rearranges who pays for the existing system. And yes, some working people will win temporarily. As Josh Fleece had laid out, there will be some people that do that. But there's millions of other working people who are going to permanently lose. 
And we're still going to be stuck in an unsustainable electricity system that's just too expensive because rates are going to keep going up. The utility tax or fixed charge, whatever you want to call it, is going to keep going up. And so we haven't really solved the root cause of the problem. On electrification, the only thing I'll add is that um, I work with a growing group, of which we'll get into in a moment, of um, organizations that are really, really concerned about where this is going. And um, um, there was a poll that was done recently, and we're happy to share kind of like, you know, the details. But um, likely voters, all voters, and then, you know, some combination thereof was asked basically, would these proposals um, make you more or less likely to electrify? And we represented the fixed charge very similar to how Adam presented it in the beginning. So very, very neutral. And what you can see here is that um, most people are actually less likely to electrify with a fixed charge. That's their first cut of the whole thing. So what Joe just said earlier is really, really important to say, like we're in uncharted territory here. And I'm sure the proponents of, the, of a high fixed charge will give you some data that says, yes, this is gonna actually help electrification. And we'll have some reason to say that this poll isn't, isn't good or the, or the flagstaff research isn't good. The point is we're in uncharted territory and there's a lot of evidence that this is not going to have the impact on electrification that proponents say it would. And I think we should be taking that very, very seriously. As for rooftop solar, the only thing I'm just gonna say is spreadsheets can only tell you so much. What matters is what everyday people do and respond to policy changes. The initial picture of last year's NEM3 decision is not good as many of us predicted. Um, the solar industry is already beginning to con contract because of NEM3. We're starting to see very large amounts of layoffs. But frankly, we won't have the full picture until Q1 or Q2 of next year. So anyone that's trying to really predict you know, what's going on, like, oh, this isn't going to have a big impact or what have you, let's just see what consumers do. And I will just say the initial picture on the ground is not good. So adding something like this into it, certainly not good. But again, this is a small fraction of the number of people who will be negatively impacted, whose bills are going to go up. Most of the people that are going to get impacted by a high fixed charge don't have solar. They just happen to live in an apartment, a condo, or a small home. And um, that, that's going to be the reason why their, their bills go up. Um, there are way better ways to reduce electricity prices and also get people to electrify without punishing millions of low energy users. You heard a lot of that. We could be increasing the care and fairer subsidy, and we could be expanding eligibility. We could be doing more to encourage conservation, energy efficiency, and solar. I will say these are the gateway drugs to electrification. When people start to do really aggressive conservation, energy efficiency, and solar, they think, oh yeah, now I want to plug more things in. And that is you know, a really, really big deal. It's not the only thing, but it is one very important thing that we should be not throwing out or going backwards on. And to boot, it also helps to reduce the cost of the grid, which we'll get to in just a second. I think you just heard a great description on how we ought to be piloting new ways to use time of use rates to encourage electrification. We could even consider a, a fixed charge um, as well, but just do it, start small and pilot it, you know, like actually test it out before you just go into uncharted territory. But I'd say most important is we have to fix the root cause of high electricity prices, which is uncontrolled spending on long distance power lines and peak infrastructure. We should not be assuming that's just the way it's gonna be guys, and you can't do anything about it. There are lots of things that we could be doing to bend the cost curve. There's, this is very much similar to healthcare. And when President Obama went and did Obamacare, you will notice that what he did was first, there was a lot of subsidies to just buy down the cost of health insurance for people, but there were a lot of initiatives also to just reduce the cost of healthcare to reduce hospital prices, drug prices, insurance prices. Some of them went through, some of them didn't. Some are still in progress. The point isn't to say whether Obamacare is good or not. It's just to say that's the approach. And there is not very much of a robust conversation happening in Sacramento over how do you bend the cost curve. And there's lots of strategies that we could be doing that would make the, the situation better over the long run. So there's short-term things to do, long-term things to do. Finally, I would just say, for those who are concerned about all of this, I would invite you to join a growing coalition that's right now about 170 nonprofit organizations around the state, renters' rights organizations, affordable housing organizations, environmental justice organizations, climate change groups, and social justice groups that have come together to ask the state legislature to repeal what they, what they did last year. It's not to say don't do a utility tax. It's say repeal your, 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 your vote, which was not done in the best public process. This is a really big change. You ought to be going back start from the beginning, do it this time the right way with a lot of involvement, with frontline communities, with the public, be upfront about what it is that you're doing. Let's have now all the facts on the table now that we really know what the impact would be and then decide, does it make sense to do something or not? And maybe we should go in a totally different direction and do some of these other strategies or maybe do that plus a small fixed charge to get started. 
but start over and repeal what you did and do it the right way. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Dave, and thank you everybody for your your time, your attention, your your energy, your ideas. Um, I I think that having spoken to all of the gentlemen that are here online tonight, I can tell you that absolutely every one of them wants the same thing. We all want things to get better. We all want to go to electrification. We all want people to be able to afford to function in a world that's getting increasingly more difficult to function in. Um, and so I am going to I, I, I'm going to ask all of you guys, I'm going to put a question out there. I'm going to start with the questions that have four votes on them. Uh, and then if you guys, if you have an answer to the question, take a minute or two to answer the question so that I can go on to the next ones. Anyone who does not get their questions answered here tonight, um, I am right now going to, uh, where was it? I had it. Um, here are the email addresses of the, um, of everyone that's on this, all the speakers and facilitators who are on this call tonight. Um, I am, I have been assured by all of them that, uh, that they're willing to answer your questions outside this meeting. Now it won't get recorded, but you'll get your answer. So um, I am going to answer the first question, which is somebody asked, it doesn't have any votes, but do Community Choice Association CC, CCAs need to comply with AB 205? The uh, short answer to anything, any question like that is, yep, everybody has to comply. The, um, the, uh, the utilities have control over all the lines, and so they're going to continue to do what they're going to continue to do whether we like it or not. Um, so I'm going to go down to, um, is it true that the mandated utility tax was passed without public discussion? If so, why? Go ahead. Josh, Matthew, Mohit, Ben, Dave. Anybody? I'll just I'll just offer the following, and I'm not going to defend the legislative process because it's generally a terrible process. As someone who's been involved for many many years, um, in this particular instance, um, the proposal for an income graduated fixed charge in state law was included in the governor's May revised proposal for his budget. So he released it in a document in May. There was a hearing um, between the Assembly Budget and Utilities and Energy Committee. There was sort of a joint hearing budget policy. Um, that discussed the the proposed revise. It included um, an item related to the income graduated fixed charge. I actually was there and testified um, at that time on that issue and many others. Um, so there was a hearing. Uh, you know, was it the kind of hearing that people would would feel like was a robust uh, you know exploration of the issues? No. And by the way, almost no legislative hearing ever is. If you've ever spent time in Sacramento watching a hearing on a very complicated bill. Even the most complicated bills, um, opponents, by the way, get typically two minutes to speak, um, meaning, and there's two, two opponents get two minutes, so four minutes of opposition testimony is typically allowed for a normal bill. So the legislative process is not a great one. Um, the language was out there. Members didn't like having to vote on an omnibus package. They never do. If you listen to the debate on every single trailer bill that gets voted on, people complain about it. Um, because they say, oh, there's something in here that I don't know that much about, and it's a 300 page bill. This is a, a, a structural problem with the way we do legislation in California. But the idea that it never got a hearing and that no one knew it was out there is is not true if anybody was paying attention at the time. Okay. It was a very short window of time to be paying attention. Yeah, Dave? You're muted, sir. I was just going to latch on to that last piece. I mean, everything Matt described is accurate, but just you make a big change, a policy change, and one that you know is going to be controversial. You know, there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. And I think, I mean, people can decide, it, maybe it's a Rorzach test of what you think, you know, is the way that things ought to work. But not only is this just not the way things ought to work, but I think it was intentionally, I, my, my feeling is this was intentionally done this way, because I think the proponents of it, and I'm not, not talking to you, Matt or Mohit, I'm talking about 
the powers that truly people above our pay grades here wanted to see this happen and was afraid of what would happen if it was done in the public eye. That, that's, that's what it looks like to me. The, there are several questions that, that lean towards this idea of if the main point is to save money for low-income households, why aren't they just increasing the care and fair discount rather than creating this whole other system? Mohit? So two reasons. First is that the care and fair discount comes from other customers, right? And to the extent rates are important, as Dave pointed out, there is a hard line between who's care and who's not care. We need to take care of rates as a whole. And then the, the idea really is to bring volumetric rates more in line with the cost to produce electricity and the environmental impacts. And you need to reduce rates for everybody to do that. And I know there's been an argument that income graduate fixed charges reduce transparency. That could be your viewpoint, but they also enhance transparency. If you control the volumetric rate, everybody sees it in their monthly bills, how much utility fixed costs are going up every year. So it also helps bring more scrutiny to how much they're increasing their fixed charges. So an RDC term proposal says the volumetric rates shouldn't go up more than inflation year on year so that we see the remaining rate increases transparently go up in the in the fixed charge portion. Anybody else want to respond to that? Yeah, uh, um, Matthew. Yo. This Matthew, is, this you have to ben. unmute. Why don't we let Ben go first? Yeah, oh, I'm just, sorry, I didn't. I can't see him. Yeah, just in terms of the transparency argument, um, anything when it's a single line item on the bill is not transparent. You know, you don't know if it's including five cost components. You don't know if it's including six. When they pass a separate component, you don't know what got added. You don't know if they're including transmission or distribution. You, If you're a CCA customer and you're asking about the PCIA, which is the the, the charge associated with leaving utility service, uh, service and moving to a community choice aggregator, right? That's a unique identifier based on the specific month and the specific year when you are added. So having all of those customers with a specific unique charge would just be not only non-transparent, but unbelievably complex. Um, the existing billing system gives you a specific line item for each component of the bill, and changing that and reducing what the customer can see is inherently non-transparent. Matthew? Um. I'll just offer, well, the current system does not provide the kind of breakdown that Ben is talking about. You don't see individual transmission distribution charges. They tend to get lumped together in the bill presentation. You can look at them if you wanna go into the tariff sheets and I encourage everybody to do that, go to the utility websites and look at the tariffs, but that's not really what shows up on the bill. So I don't think there's a good argument that transparency um, is somehow improved under the current system as opposed to a system where we had a standard fixed charge. Um, but on the care discount issue, um, look, Turn strongly supports increasing the care discount. Well, we would like very much to see those discounts go up for care customers and for fewer customers. We'd like them to be paid as much as possible out of the state general fund using state income tax revenues, which are very progressively collected. And we've actually put forward proposals in Sacramento to do that. They so far have not gotten traction. So we'll continue to, to look at that option and we will be strongly supportive of it. Um, we're not suggesting perhaps when you, that, Matthew, perhaps when you're ready to put that forward, um, if you could send it to us, we can send it out to everyone. And if you, if, if that's something that needs support, we will see what we can do to help you. Um, great. we would look forward to having support from this group for dealing with average rates and utility spending and low income discounts. This is one where I think our coalition should be able to agree that we all have a shared set of objectives. California should be encouraging conservation. A large fixed fee discourages conservation, does it not? I can take that as well. Um, so a lot of my background is in energy efficient conservation. And I do agree that we need to encourage conservation. But the question is how much and who pays for that signal of encouragement and conservation. Even after implementing the turn and NRDC proposal, the volumetric rates that would encourage conservation would be the highest in the country, save Hawaii. And they'll be back to our 2020 level. 
So we aren't gutting the signal for conservation, we're just realigning it to better balance conservation and electrification. Anybody else? Dave? I, I have to just confess, I didn't totally understand, you know, the logic and I don't know if we have time to kind of get into it. So maybe this is an offline thing, but just, you know, I have, I have, a, I have a background in consumer advocacy. Um, I worked for the public interest research groups for 25 years as an advocate and an organizer. Um, I've had a front row seat to just how consumers respond to policy. And they oftentimes respond differently than the spreadsheets say that they will respond. And, um, you know, I think the, the police, you know, Josh's analysis, Flagstaff analysis really kind of speaks to this, but I think also we've seen this in other areas of the country when things like this happen, when you get past a certain point, it discourages conservation, just straight up, just consumers respond and they go, why should I bother turning off the lights? Why should I bother installing insulation? The, 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 the returns are just not going to be there. And um, this is why I think a lot of us are saying not don't ever do a fixed charge, but just don't start so high so quickly. Pilot it, start small, watch the effects. Yes, this is an urgent problem we have to fix, but yes, also, if we make big mistakes too quickly, then it's gonna set us backwards. And this, we, we can't afford to lose energy efficiency and conservation in the wheelhouse. And this could very well put us in danger of doing that. Let me go into this next question because I think it dovetails. Matthew, I'm sorry, you wanted to say something? I just wanted to offer that right now, um, the way rates are today, there are enormous incentives to conserve. And in fact, we're seeing, we get, we have a consumer hotline. People have challenges with dealing with their utilities and their utility bills. And we get all sorts of calls from people who are struggling to pay their bills. Um, these people do not need additional incentives to conserve. They're already right in front of them. People who can barely afford to pay their monthly bill very well understand that increasing their usage is driving them into a place where they have to choose between a utility bill, medicine, rent, you know, the like. Um, and customers who live in hot parts of the state, the hot inland areas, average customer middle income uses twice, has twice the average bill of a coastal customer. So if you live in a hot inland area, you know what I'm talking about. And if you say, well, AC is air conditioning should be, you know, something that you just use less of on a hot summer day if it's 110 degrees out. Um, you know, I don't think that that's the policy we should be promoting. We certainly want people to use energy efficiently, but we need people to be able to live comfortably. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do is to figure out how to make it more affordable. Um, understanding that rate design doesn't solve the affordability problem, that is solved by dealing with overall utility rates. And that's where I think we all have common ground. Mohit? I wanted to add that when we talk about conservation, Matt addressed the point about consumers using less, but there's also the point about you buy the efficient equipment and install it. And California has made great strides in transforming markets and changing codes and standards. You really can't buy a lot of inefficient appliances, refrigerators, and light bulbs anymore. So although I agree, when you reduce rates, there is a danger people will buy slightly less efficient goods. But the amount we can black slide is very less than compared to what it was. You can't buy incandescent light bulbs for residential homes anymore. And this, you know, it's not easy to do all of that. So we have guardrails for that. And our rates would still be the highest in the country. So there's still enough incentive for energy efficiency and conservation. Uh, just to break down the issue a little bit, because Matthew really focused on the affordability side of things and Mohit really addressed kind of the backslide effect. And I think they're two different things and shouldn't be conflated. The first is an affordability issue. And so that's why the concept of a fixed charge has been raised. But just because there are affordability issues doesn't mean we should ruin incentives for conservation and efficiency for the rest of the rate base. Um, and then A, and then B is the fact that California is kind of trying to bring all of the ratepayers on a specific trajectory, right? California has been really pushing energy efficiency, really been pushing conservation for the past 20 plus years. And that's been kind of the name of the game, right? And then more recently, there's been a push for intelligent use of electricity, right? Using less grid energy when the grid is strained and more grid energy when there is more renewable energy available. And so what it comes down to is there are separate issues on this 
you know, related to this fixed charge, but we have to be sure that we continue to bring Californians along on the same track and going from a, a mindset of conservation and energy efficiency rule all to now, oh, that's no longer the case and going from, you know, a pathway of we're trying to have rates that are more time based and based on real time is a specific trajectory and, you know, basically adding bumps along the course are going to make it harder for average Californians to follow along and understand the transition in a way where they're actually using intelligent uses of energy. And when that happens, the people who pay is everyone because we have higher rates and there's more transmission build out. The name of the game is local generation and choice that results in intelligent uses of energy and a high fixed charge just does not. I'm sure we're really running out of time, but there are several questions that point to the same issue, and I think it needs to be um, discussed before we before we end for the night, uh, which is it has to do with solar, rooftop solar, um, but also other older, um, you know, solar that 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 have been put into place by. Um, <clears throat> mini marts mini malls and and stuff like that where they've got uh the solar over their roof isn't this going to damage the rooftop solar industry i mean there's a lot of folks that work in rooftop solar in california and i don't remember who mentioned a little while ago um but yeah there have been massive layoffs and where are those people gonna go now they're not going to be able to afford their bill either. So if you could just maybe speak a little bit to solar, how how it's affected here, how it isn't affected here, what are your thoughts? Yeah, check it. maybe I'll go there because, uh, I mean, I spent most of my career in the solar industry working for various companies, installers, and manufacturers. Um, NEM 3.0, right, losing the, the net metering and moving to NEM 3.0 uh, has been a real significant kick, as you've heard. I don't have the, the direct statistics, Dave might, but um, it has hit the, the small and medium-sized installers particularly hard. They will be able to correct and transition moving to storage, right? People would put in site, sited storage, but the cost of storage, as we know, like the cost of EVs has to come down. They remove the subsidy much faster then the cost of storage is coming down. So there's this massive road bump. Hopefully in three to five years, it'll correct. Uh, myself and others were hoping that the CPUC would give a glide path, right? Like a five-year glide path. They did not. They cut it off. Um, so having this fixed charge implemented on top of the move to NEM3 literally within a year uh, is really causing two strong headwinds. It's almost like a headwind and then a, a tsunami onto the industry. Um, so it's going to be hard and it is going to be a significant impact. I think, as Debbie said, we're not going to see what that impact is until the first half of next year, uh, but it will be significant. Um, and, and then to go back and say the fixed charge isn't just on new solar customers, but existing solar customers. Typical solar customers will almost net their bill down to zero. I think most people were expecting to see a fixed charge proposal on the order of $15 a month. So a solar customer might have had a $10 a month charge by doing 90% bill reduction, which is typical. So they might have had a $10 bill plus $15.25. That's okay to them. They don't like it, but I think they can swallow that. But moving from 10 to 75 is, you know, they signed up for a deal five years ago and the state ripped the deal away. So they're going to say, why should I buy solar? Or any, any of their friends would say, why am I going to buy solar tomorrow if the state reneged on their deal from five years ago? They'll just do it again. It's, it's the... the the level of the fixed charge is not sort of commensurate to what existing solar customers are used to. It will be a big hit. Matthew. Thanks. Um, I guess I just offer a few observations. One is that, um, you know, when people got solar installed, historically, they were given um, estimates by installers. How much are you going to save over 10 years, 20 years? And what are those installing? What are those assumptions? look at in terms of future retail rate increases well typically they assumed about four percent a year rate increases that was the way that they calculated what the savings would be like for a for the customer and that's what people use to make their decisions about whether it was cost effective 
Well, rates have increased by so much more than 4%, we've basically blown those assumptions out of the water. So whatever you thought you were saving when you bought a solar system five or 10 years ago, um, those savings have been much higher. Now, why is it that you might not be aware of it is because you're not paying those rates. Those are the rates you would have paid if you weren't on solar. And when the PUC did modeling under the NEM 3.0 decision about payback periods, looking at a nine-year payback period, what assumption did they use about how much rates would increase over time? 4% a year. We've already blown way past that. We're looking at double digit percentage rate increases. And even under a fixed charge, we're still going to be seeing volumetric rates increase, I believe, by well more than that 4% metric that was used for payback. I'll just offer one more data point, which is that we modeled the impact of our proposed fixed charge, meaning our second version, which included a high income charge on legacy net metering customers. How would it affect them? And what we found is that if you're a care customer, a low income customer with solar, 50 to 80% of those customers, depending on utility and climate zone, um, would be better off or neutral. 50 to 80% would be better off or neutral if you're low income. For middle income customers, between a quarter and 40% of customers would either be the same or better off. And for high income customers, 10 to 30% would be the same or better off. So the idea that everyone loses as an existing net metering customer is just not aligned with what we're seeing in the data um, because customers have all different unique situations, including those with solar. So I think that there's a much more nuanced and balanced portrait that people need to understand here. Matthew, I, th I think you're right about that, but I also think that um, there have been a whole host of people who invested in solar maybe eight, nine months ago because they saw NEM 2.3.0 coming. And so, I mean, there's a whole lot of people sitting on a whole lot of debt that came about in the last year, and now they're getting hit with this. It seems, it seems a lot. And one of the things that I heard voiced tonight that I have not heard voiced very much is that what if there is a pilot situation? I mean, what if we decide to, okay, I don't think anybody's saying, no, nothing needs to change. Everybody's saying something needs to change. It's how do we do it? And how do we do it in a way that rewards positive behavior and ignores negative behavior? Because I'm a psychologist. And that's how you get stuff done. You ignore negative behavior and reward positive behavior. That's not what I'm seeing here. Looks like we're gonna, yeah. So uh, Dave. Yeah, just quickly, cause I know we're out of time. Mm -hmm. um, just two quick things. One, I'm just gonna say it again. Spreadsheets can only tell you so much how actual consumers respond to policy is what you wanna look at. And what I'm really interested in when we ask the solar question is not necessarily the 2 million people that have solar now, I care about that a lot, but what about the 5 million people right now who might want solar or 10 million people who are struggling for which you know, this would make a really big difference both for them and for the state. And what we're seeing the early signs are that everyday people and previous to all of this, the average income of a household getting solar was going down, 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 down. Now what we're seeing is a reversal. We're going back to now where solar is truly something that only wealthier people can get, at least for the next five, six, seven years until battery prices go down. Again, we will have to see what, what the data says, but the early signs are not good. And I think we have to look at actually what consumers are doing you know, when we make our judgments, not just like what the modeling says. But I want to really say that we could get focused on solar and, and we should, obviously, I run the Solar Rights Alliance, so I care a lot about solar. But I also work with a coalition of groups that don't necessarily represent people who have solar. They represent frontline communities, low-income communities, renters, people who live in affordable housing. And so I just wanna kind of pivot the solar question back to going, the vast majority of the negative impact of a high utility tax, even something that's $30 a month, as the data shows, will be on millions of people who don't have solar, but they just happen to live in an apartment, a condo, or small home, a lot of those people will be functionally low income. A lot of those people will just be middle income people who are just trying to get there, who are struggling. And to me, you know, I feel like my charge is to kind of like anytime I can to just center everyone around. That's the vast majority of people who would get hurt if we move too fast, too soon on something like this. And then yes, solar and conservation, we should care about that too. But that's a smaller number of people. 
and I assume we want the greatest good for the greatest number of people over the longest period of time, I don't think anyone would want that collateral damage to happen in service of a policy change. And so just, yes, solar, but remember that too. Mohit, did you have one more thing? Yes, uh, two more things that I'll be succinct. Firstly, with regards to the pilot question and the gradualism, the utilities move pretty slow in everything almost, and any fixed charge that they implement, um, first version, a much smaller version may not be in place for a couple of years at least. And pg e has said in their filings, they can make any changes until early 2028. So there is time for just, we support taking a first step, going halfway, and then moving on from that. And um, I'd like to offer one comment on the income graduation, who loses, who benefits and not. When Turn and NRDC constructed our proposal, when we say low, medium, and high, our low, medium, and high are like the bottom 33%, the medium 33%, and the upper 33% of earners. We took a lot of care to ensure that the middle section are mostly indifferent to our income graduate fixed charge. The lower 33% benefit, and most of the money comes from the upper 33%. So that's our intention. That's our hope. We understand that there are a lot of people over and above care that don't live plush lives. And we've tried our best to be responsive of it. And I just ask that whenever we make comments about who wins, who loses, please show your data. We should all show our data transparently and then talk about it from there. Thank you. You know, this group of people, you were such an amazing group of people who all are very passionate about what you do. And I would certainly like to see you have more dialogue amongst yourselves and ourselves as we move forward. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just appreciate all of your time. Does anybody have a last comment? Adam, do you have something you need to say? Um, just like you, Terry, I just want to say thank you to all of you for participating tonight. It's been really great and very helpful. I, I think people got to hear a lot of more, a lot more detail on an issue that most people are, don't really know that much about. So, so thanks everybody. Here, I, I put the emails in the chat one more time. If you want to um, grab those emails, um, Ben, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Just quickly. I want to thank everyone. It's been great to discuss and then just kind of do a call to action. Um, you know, having your participation in any form is great. Um, the CPC is is looking for public comments, um, and that's particularly important in this case. Uh, the Clean Coalition and other parties requested public participation hearings, so the CPC would have to take the show on the road and actually hear from members of the public. Um, the utilities opposed it. They said we were too early, and the judge opposed it. They said we were too late. So once again, the CPC is making it very difficult for people to have these conversations and, and to really hear from the citizens of California. So, you know, if you have the opportunity or can figure it out, adding comments to that public comment section is, is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I, I, we're we're at 8 10, so we really gotta go. But oh my gosh, thank you all so much for your patience. Thanks for hanging in there. Please keep in touch with each other. Please reach out to these folks if you have a question that didn't get answered tonight. Um, take that email list and put it someplace special because you're going to need it. Um, perhaps we'll meet again in a year. I'm just throwing that out there. Let's meet again in a year and see where we are. Um, but thank you. All Thank right. you for organizing. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks for Bye. thanks for hanging there with us.